i mun hérna þegar ég fór til Ikea eftir bara svona þrý dagar eftir ég lendi á Íslandi og það var svona tíminn sem ég heyri íslensku tungumálið í fyrsta skipti Ikea. og það var svona, já ég hugsa bara what have I done? Like, how the heck am I going to learn this language? Benjamin Hartman is a photographer who left his job as an accountant in Australia to move to Iceland and figure out a way to support his stay here as a photographer. Hopefully you've stumbled upon his work on social media. Benjamin has a huge Instagram account where he posts unique pictures of his travels in the Arctic, mainly from Iceland, where he now lives. Two years ago I got to go with Benjamin on a photo shoot. At the time he lived on Kverviskata, downtown very downtown Reykjavik, and I remember him telling me that he traveled to the countryside five out of seven days of the week. I was blown away by the effort he was making to capture all these moments in nature, and now two years later he figured it would make his life a lot easier if he just lived in the countryside. So he made it happen. From being an accountant to becoming a photographer, from Australia to Iceland and from Kverviskata to Grimsnes. Ben talks to me about these decisions of change, the challenges of being a freelancer and his own boss, and where his drive to go out every morning and shoot pictures in nature comes from. Benjamin is a super cool guy, relaxed and calm, but still lives this very active and adventurous lifestyle where he travels the country for a living, leading him on trips around Iceland to Greenland and Svalbard as well. The easiest way for you to find his work is on Instagram, at Benjamin Hartmann. And if you haven't already, I encourage you to follow that guy, especially if you're Icelandic, because this is not the part of Iceland you've seen before. If you're not Icelandic, then the next two minutes will be difficult to understand, but let them be a lesson and try to learn from them instead of fast forwarding. By the way, Benjamin is shockingly good at Icelandic, as you get to hear in this episode. You kind of figured that this episode is going to be in English, but like he, he gives an example of his Icelandic skills, and they are... I, I was I was shocked. Þátturinn er í boði Orego og Joanna Juice. Afslættin er halda áfram. Orego býður öllum hlustendum podcastsins 15% afslátt af okkar uppáhalds íþróttaherndunum. Bose Soundsport Free. Farðu inn á netverslun.is, settu þið körfuna og notaðu afslátakóðan Snorri. S-N-O-R-R-I eins og í Selurinn Snorri eða Snorra Saga Strullisunar eða Snorri Björs Podcast Kóðin gildir út nóvember á netaslund.is búin að afgreiða jólagjöfina í árfyrir ykkur ekki að þakka, þetta er örgli fyrsta skipti sem að greiða jólagjöf í nóvember en ekki á Þorlóksmessu Heyrnartólun er frábær fyrir allar hefingu haldast í eirun á þér meðan þú æfir hleðslandu í lengi, hljómgeðin er fárla góð og þau eru þráðlaus það er engi þræðir og 15% Gleðlega jól. Ef þú elskar kaffi og hatar kvef, þá getur þú farið á alla staði Joanna Juice á höfuborgarsvæðinu og beðið um kaffi plus engifer eða túrmerikskot á 500 íslenska krónur. Þú ert að hlusta á afsláttarhornið í Nes Norri Björs podcast show og hér erum við með Joanna Juice afslátt fyrir hlustandi podcastsins. Hvort sem þú vilt espresso skot, latte með laufbláður mjólk, americano eða uppáhelling, pantaðir kaffi sem þú vilt og fá þér engifer eða túrmerikskot með á aðeins 500 krónur. Aðeins fyrir hlustandi podcastsins og út nóvember mánuð 2018. Þarf að bæta ykkur við þetta. Snorri Björs podcast sjó afslátur 500 krónur. John Juice, 15 bóðs afslátur í netvistlun.is af Bósansport Free. Við getum bara henda okkur yfir í hennar þátt. Á ensku. Kallinn hendi sér bara á enskuna. Þetta getur maður. Þetta gerir maður. Hér eru hlutinni framkvæmdir. Fyrsti þáttur podcastsins á ensku. Hér er svo. Benjamin Hartmann. Let's do it. Benjamin Hartman, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. I'm uh, very excited to be doing this in English, but I'm <laughs> also very shocked that you actually speak Icelandic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like very shocked because I worked with you like two years ago and I only spoke English to you and now you just like inform me that you're very capable of of uh, keeping conversation in Icelandic. Very basic conversation. No, you said like some very advanced words just <laughs> moments ago so uh, so uh, i have to compliment you on, on that one <laughs> uh, so now you live in iceland you're a photographer yeah and uh five years ago you were in australia right yeah where you lived at that time i lived and studied in australia 
grew up there in the West Coast and born was, there. Yeah, of course. Yeah, of born, course. <laughs> of course. My accent. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I uh, I was raised in in the West of Australia, very close to the beach, in a in a little area close. To the the most famous place near my residential area was Fremantle. Fremantle. Yeah. If you've been to Western Australia, anyone there would probably have heard of Fremantle. So yeah, I grew up roaming around there and um, and then went to university in Perth and started to study accounting. Wow. Yeah, and then I... You've um, come a long way. <laughs> it's so useful. <laughs> Super useful degree. Um, I'm not being sarcastic. <laughs> no, 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 I, I figured. <laughs> um, so yeah, then I uh, basically discovered that I could go on exchange oh. and uh, study abroad. And this pretty much changed my life. But did you choose Iceland to go? Like you didn't, no. you didn't go in as, as an exchange student to Iceland? Did you? I, uh, I went to London. Oh, okay. Yeah. But like where, where does the journey to Iceland begin? So getting to Iceland began when I was in London because okay. I overheard a story in the campus kitchen about... Iceland and the Northern Lights, and I honestly think this was the first time I'd ever heard of Iceland. Really? Like, I have no memory before 2013 of Iceland. <laughs> it's so insane. I have no idea. But yeah, I had I overheard this conversation, and then I was on Google, and I just instantly booked a trip. It's so easy to get here from London. So, wow. Um, I came and had a look, and yeah. Here we are. Here we are. <laughs> so, like, for the people who don't know who you are, uh, you have these, like, crazy images of Iceland pictures you've taken uh, throughout, like, last three years, four? Or did you move? I, I've i been shooting for about 10 years. Yeah, but in Iceland. But in Iceland, I moved here in 2015. And 15. that's basically when my photography career started kicked off yeah, yeah and it has led to you having like hundreds of thousands of followers on <laughs> instagram and like praised by like world famous photographer and you've become like a world famous photographer you can't deny that like <laughs> having half a million followers on instagram that like that's huge yeah i mean it's a significant outreach for photography especially yeah um so super grateful for that platform instagram and yeah it opens a lot of doors Obviously, yeah. And and so you're studying accounting in Australia? Yes. And have you like did you had you begun uh, taking pictures at that time? I was shooting uh assisting for weddings actually. Really? Yeah. So back then um my photography was focused on literally just learning how to use a camera. Okay, so and but the interest was there. Super interested in okay. it. Yeah. So I was helping with weddings and taking pictures of surfers a lot down at the beach. My one of my best friends, he was really into bodyboarding. So we used to go and uh take trips and I used to photograph and he used to surf and yeah. It was really cool for learning. So the element of you like traveling around and being out in nature and shooting pictures, it was there to yeah. begin with. Yeah, definitely. Growing up, I spent a lot of time in the bush, riding motorbikes and general shenanigans with in my the bush. family. In the bush, mate. What does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> in the countryside. Let's okay. put it that way. <laughs> okay, okay. That's a, that's a better way to put it. <laughs> and and you, uh, I, I checked out your Flickr page. Like my, I, oh yeah, okay. Like that, that's probably an old one, right? <laughs> yeah. Like you haven't updated it in, in in a long time. No. And which which I was looking for because I wanted to see like wait like because you have this really distinctive style and like you know a Benjamin Harmon picture when you see it, but like I was looking for something old like something that like everybody who's like starting out in photography tries to do like you're trying to figure out what you like and like i think this Flickr page is so obvious because like you're you're doing pictures of people you're doing pictures of like buildings in <laughs> london and like some surfing pictures some surfing yeah yeah and it like just looked like you didn't have have any direction like you were following no. you weren't like you didn't have any style back then like what what is your journey as a photographer look like I feel like I often say this, that the best way to learn is to just shoot everything that you can find and yeah. try every style and every method of taking photos that you can. 
And that's that's what I did. I I uh, have some really funny memories of shooting like macro photos of bees and like just trying to get really close. And like, I remember breaking a lens because the bee landed on my lens and I was trying this super nerdy technique of flipping the lens and holding it up to the camera oh, backwards. Like, oh, yeah, 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 I've done that. Yeah, <laughs> and I like freaked out, dropped the camera and the lens like smashed on the ground. No and way. It was like a 51.2. And you uh, have to like... like when you do it, you have to like bring it super up close, right? Super close. <laughs> <laughs> so this wasp or bee just landed on my lens. Damn. Yeah. So I I tried everything that I could. Yeah. Yeah. I think the first Flickr photo I posted was a picture of a clock on a wall. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, that's something different to what we see on your feed today. Uh, you also had like some long exposure stuff going on, like cars yeah. driving, and that's like. I I relate to that because I like when I was trying out like just different cameras and lenses I just like walked outside and like did pictures of the moon or just cars driving around or just anything and yeah. like kind of the same as you're saying just taking pictures of anything to figure out what works. Yeah. But what did you find like how do you wh- why do you start shooting landscape? Would you I say think- landscape is your primary style yeah for sure yeah it's definitely evolved into many smaller facets of landscape photography yeah, but definitely i started out basically taking photos of nature yeah in australia is probably better yeah yeah exactly uh, i'm not sure like i think it just like really combined all of my interests my yeah. interest in being outside and being in nature in the my, bush in the bush mate yeah <laughs> in the bush, in the bush mate, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and my general nerdiness for photography and I just love like tech and I, I was super interested in, you know, getting all the different filters for my lens and just like any small little cool interesting gadget that could help me take a new style of photo. Mm. So, um, yeah, I used to like roam on eBay finding like $2 lens filters and stuff like that, <laughs> anything basically. And I think, yeah, this just combined all of my interests and it was super just like not even thought about. I just, it just, the camera landed in my hand and I started to use it kind of. And how do you go down the path of uh, shooting weddings? Um, Through family friends, we ended up um, connecting and um, basically I was offered to just join as an assistant and see how it went and... I did like 10 weddings or something assisting oh, okay. and I also started to edit those weddings and that's where I learned a lot about workflow and using Lightroom and Photoshop. Oh, okay. Yeah, good so, for learning. So you were just like playing around in London with the camera when you got there? Yeah, so getting to that point in the story, I um, there's, a no, there's a whole nother side of me that used to exist. Okay, so <laughs> tell me more. <clears throat> so I used to play in hardcore bands okay do you know that genre no uh, well it's, yeah i know the genre yeah, but i yeah. don't know th- that about you <laughs> no yeah yeah so like you know like crossover between like punk thrash metal like blended into one kind of type of thing and basically yeah since high school up through to university i was always in a band of some kind and um my outlet for photography was able to progress through touring with bands no way um, so when I actually got home from this time in London, I joined one of my favorite bands. I took over as a guitar player. Seriously? And, uh, yeah, they're called Blackout, B-L-K-O-U-T. Yeah. Blackout. And, um, and we were able to tour Europe, which was a massive thing. So I got home from Europe. How old are you by then? I was 20, 20. You're t- <laughs> 2020. <laughs> yes. Okay. And uh, now you're 25, right? Yes, 25. Born 93, mm-hmm. which is shocking compared to your what your beard looks like. <laughs> yes, the beard <laughs> says otherwise. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you're playing. Uh, what 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 did you call the genre? Like hardcore. Hardcore music. Yeah. So kind of angry. You were heavy. angry at that time. Well, I've never been angry. I feel like I've always been kind of calm and composed. Yeah, I have but to maybe, agree with that. M- yeah, maybe all the anger was let out on the stage. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, th- this opened uh, up a whole new world of traveling for me. And me and my friends were able to, yeah, basically travel Europe by bus. Um, 
staying in on the floors in random houses, like very grungy style of touring. Um, Did you like it? Oh yeah, it was super fun. But I miss it. It's probably it. tough, right? Definitely t- tough on the body. Tough on the body? Yes. Not so, on the mental side? Um, no, because you're having a lot of fun when, yeah, you're, okay. when you're touring. Okay. Yeah. Friends and just traveling and exactly. enjoying and like it. Because it wasn't a serious band. Like, yes, it was serious, but it wasn't like our career. Mm. That made us be able to have more fun with it, I think. And um, yeah, we, we traveled all through Europe. We did like 13,000 kilometers of driving or something. Yeah. And I just took photos the whole time. And I think all the all the stuff I'd learned up to then, plus this, created like a pretty well-rounded beginning for my current photographic self. You don't like, you weren't that worried that you were like wasting your time because like you weren't, as you say yourself, you weren't that serious about it. Like you didn't think of it as a career. You were just like enjoying the moment and traveling with friends. Yeah, I mean, it was all. All of this was done while I was still studying accounting and finance. Okay, in that's all the holidays. A pretty funny combo. Yeah, I was like, uh, I was also in a band in London when I lived there, um, and they were based in Nottingham. And I used to go up there and and practice, and then come back. And I was doing my assignments on the train, going to band practice in Nottingham, and then we'd go on tour in super random places in Europe. And I'd be doing my assignments, using my phone internet to like submit it while we're on tour. <laughs> this was crazy. But um, but yeah, the degree worked out in the end. Despite all the madness along the way, I managed to finish my degree, which awesome. I'm super but happy with. But did you want to do it? Like, did those sites, like, you were not trying to do it, like, for your parents or, like, you really wanted to be an accountant, but still in a hardcore rock band? <laughs> I mean, isn't that a weird combination? <laughs> yeah, like, you're the only one I know. <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess I just didn't know anything better yeah. at the time. Especially going into university, I just, there was no direction for me, kind of. This is just the thing that I thought, yeah, that's practical. <laughs> I like it. Like, it was the thing I did best in with grades. So I went for that. And um, and yeah, it ended up, this is the craziest part of that degree. So it ended up, I finished the degree and I was like, all right, I'm going to get a job in Perth. So I went into an auditing firm. Uh, or an insolvency trading firm or something. And I told them what I do, like in my hobbies. Yeah, I'm in a punk band, like been touring all around Europe and stuff. But yeah, no, I'm ready to like enter this kind of uh, a career in finance and accounting. And I I studied for days about this company and, and I knew that I really nailed the interview. And I was like, got my job. Like I've I've finished my degree and I've got stable employment. Yes. And then a week later, I get a reply, hey, Ben, like, we absolutely loved your application, but we think that you're maybe too creative for the role. No way. And uh, therefore, we cannot offer you the job. Um, we don't think that you're, like, they basically said that I wasn't, like, inside the box enough. I thought too far outside of the box for their company. And I was like, whoa. All right. That's a <laughs> sign. <laughs> you really thought that way. Yeah. Like, and, and did that, like, have an impact on you? Yeah, it had a, a really big impact. I spent, like, three days writing a massive angry email back at why that was the, like, stupid decision. Like, <laughs> how can it be bad to be creative? Like, isn't that what all, like, accounting companies need? I don't know. Anyway, it's great that it happened like that because it helped me progress into this lifestyle. Okay, so what happens? You sent the email? So, oh yeah oh yeah <laughs> i didn't I get a reply the email. of course okay, okay. <laughs> but the email was sent the email was sent yeah um and then i um i met amy well we went to school together my girlfriend who's also from perth in australia um and yeah we've been together since 2013 and everything that's happened since has been both of us working hard at this kind of unified goal i did of course have to convince her that moving to this crazy like place near the arctic is like a good idea but um she did she she thought it was and she came with me and yeah but you you guys begin with london right we began with australia so once i got home from london oh um, okay okay yeah then then i was able to kind of chill again like reset and then um yeah ended up with amy 
So that was awesome. So you're seriously setting up for like a, a job as an accountant, but you end up working as a photographer in Iceland. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so can you bridge that gap for me a bit? Like, how does it happen? Like, why why do you... And you, you don't just visit Iceland, you move here. Yeah, yeah. So I visited Iceland after this first visit uh, in 2013. Um, and this touring with the bands and stuff, another opportunity came up to come back to Iceland in the same year, 2013. Um, and I was on my own again. And it was the middle of winter. So for me as an Australian, I've ne I'd never really ever seen winter before. I'd seen some snow by that point, um, a little bit like when I was first here. That was really my first proper encounter other than one random snowboarding attempt in Australia because we do have some snow, just not where I'm from, okay. and I fully screwed my wrist up. <laughs> um, yeah, it was the first kind of big experiences of snow were here. So I feel like this trip in winter that I did changed my whole perspective of life. Wow. As deep as that is. How? Yeah. I was alone. I was in extreme environments. Um, wait, wait you weren't just staying in the city? No, I, I rented a little 4 by 4 and I went to, did the whole ring road. Wow, alone? Yeah, alone, yeah. And uh, back then, like, it sounds not long ago, like five years ago, but the amount of facilities and the general, like, way of traveling around is has completely changed now. Here in there's Iceland. There's just so many, yeah, here in Iceland, yeah. there's so many more facilities and things are much easier and more readily available. Back then, it was kind of crazy. So I was just, yeah, sleeping in the car, like, as an Australian with, like, no warm clothes, really, like, some, like, $20 jumper and, like... <laughs> Just, yeah, winging it, really. And you were traveling with a camera? Traveling with my camera. This mission was completely about photos now. Oh, okay, okay. By the end of 2013, I was convinced that uh, photography would become more than a hobby one day. But I was leaving my options open. So you weren't, like, getting any jobs as a photographer or anything? You just felt like it was about to happen? Yeah. Like you were going to take the step to being a photographer? Yeah. Awesome. Yep. And you come back home after that trip yep. and convince your girlfriend to move there with you. Yeah. So I, came, I come home from that trip and begin one year of saving up to, live, to move to Iceland. Wow, because okay. I feel like it's impossible to move somewhere without having some security behind you. Yeah. And for me, that was just, yeah, saving up for a while. So, yeah, I spent a year doing bookkeeping. So I was using my accounting degree. Um, just helping out with um, a local company and um, saved up enough money to facilitate the move to Iceland. And yeah, then came 2015 when the move happened. And you're just like traveling here and thinking like, I'm going to move to Iceland because you probably were like impressed by this place. Yeah. And you wanted to start your photography career over here. Yeah. And how how does one do that? Well, first step is to simply get here. Yeah. And eins og ég ástralskur, þá var erfitt að fá dvalaleifi á Íslandi. If you know dvalaleifi in Icelandic, you're pretty good at Icelandic. Yeah. It's pretty <laughs> no, obvious. No. <laughs> Já, so hérna, þá... Ég byrjaði í háskóli Íslands til að læra Íslandsku og það var bara mitt leiðin, minn leiðin til að, til að vera á Íslandi bara og til að búa á Íslandi þá, það er bara mjög erfitt til að fá bara dvalalefi <laughs> dvalalefi dvalalefi <laughs> og já ég mun hérna þegar ég fór til Íkea eftir bara svona þrý dagar eftir að lendi á Íslandi og það var svona tíminn sem ég heyri íslensku tungumálið í fyrsta skipti ég og það var svona, já ég hugsa bara what have I done? Like, how the heck am I going to learn this language? It was crazy a crazy moment for me because I'd never understood 
how complex it is until I was like, yeah, of course I can, you know, move to Iceland and learn Iceland. That's going to be exciting to learn a new language. Yeah. yeah. And then we end up there. And nu tremer det sig nå. Ja, bara mer än stiger like total Iceland ska. Ja. Ja, bara säga Það er gaman, sko. Það er gaman. <laughs> það er gaman að tala Íslensk. Yeah. So, uh, how does it start for, like, for somebody to move to a different country? That that sounds like a like difficult thing alone. But you're starting a new profession, kind of. And you don't have any connections, I guess. So how did yeah. you just, like... You'd saved up some It's... money, so you could probably stay here for a while with, like, not too much worries... Yeah, but but like, how did it begin? Like, did you just buy buy the rover and start driving to the countryside? Absolutely not. No. <laughs> <laughs> so I first step. How how do I uh, find a house? How how do I find somewhere to live? Mm. Scan through Facebook, found like Telegu or some like <laughs> Facebook group or something, and came across a, a house on our uh, school Lagata. And I was, uh, it was with a grandma in her spare room, in her small, small, small apartments. Uh, so then I, I landed here and began to live with this little cute Icelandic grandma and her dog in this tiny apartment in downtown Reykjavik. And that was, that was a crazy experience, just <laughs> like to go from, you know, my comfortable home in Australia to like a new country with no friends, no connections and living with a grandma. <laughs> It wasn't even your own grandma. <laughs> it wasn't even my own grandma. Um, and then came the idea of like, how am I going to support myself? Like, yes, I have a little bit of savings, but it's not, not going to last me more than a few months. Like, I really needed to find something to do here. So uh, on all the trips I'd done, um, I forgot to mention a couple of trips where I had brought Amy in the first year we were together. And the first one was like, Hey Amy, let's go to Iceland and you can see all the things that I love about it. The second trip is like, hey Amy, let me uh, bring you to Iceland and show you the potential of living in Iceland. So we went and saw the university and the downtown and all this stuff. And yeah, so then came this this concept of work. And throughout all the trips, I'd been staying at Kex Hostel, and that was really my safe haven in Iceland. I felt really connected to that hostel and it's just an awesome place to hang out so I asked them could I work them? could I please get a job I don't care what I'm doing I just want to kind of be here and um, uh, yeah so they let me uh, work as a housekeeper so I was making beds and cleaning the bathrooms and stuff um, very minimal work hours because I'm Australian again This word keeps coming to Bali. <laughs> It's so there's so many rules as a non-European person to live here. There there is endless things that you have to take into account and so many restrictions. Like you can only work 20 hours a week. So uh, it was really actually difficult to earn enough money to be able to stay here. Yeah, that's like yeah. something I have never like realized and hard for me to like understand because I don't know these restrictions you're faced with. Yeah, like coming here. Yeah, for me, you're just like, why can't you let this guy be here? Like he's just taking pictures and like he's a good guy. Yeah, exactly. I wish it was so easy, but um, yeah, you have to find the way that I put it is if you have enough passion and interest in a place or a thing, it's possible to make it happen somehow. As cliche as that sounds. And that was how it worked for me and for Amy. Um, after this Icelandic course, I, I actually dropped out halfway as well. So, damn, I could be fluent, properly fluent probably if I stayed in that course. But So oh, you're well, a dropout? I'm a dropout. In Iceland? Yes. That's pretty cool. Um, so, yeah, Amy uh, is Australian-British duo so she's oh, dual okay. citizen so we're able to stay here um thanks to amy's european citizenship which is amazing well wow, only um, because of that yeah so that that has enabled everything for us here so so thankful that we were able to to use that yeah um so i was working in kex hostel i was like 10 months there or something 
And throughout that entire time, I was building connections, beginning to understand how things work here and meet people and connect with people online. I started with a thousand followers on Instagram when I moved. Um, those thousand followers came from pushing. I did two exhibitions in Australia of my photos from Iceland from those first trips. Oh. Raised mo some money for Icelandic nature conservation, which was really cool. Really? Yeah. Brought it here in person. Awesome. Gave it to a guy called Arni Finstrom. No way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Pretty cool. And, um, and yeah, had these exhibitions, managed to build my social media to, you know, to a very beginning point with a thousand followers. Yeah. And was, I was so which was stoked. Probably, probably like a decent number at that time, right? Absolutely. I was yeah. like shocked that I could get to that point on yeah. social media. And after working in Cax Hostel, um, the people there are amazing. They helped me a lot to meet local creative people and the staff there became my really good friends. And yeah, it, after that 10 months, I was pretty well connected in Iceland and able to start considering a lot more about photography and whether this could be a career. Well, so you're like already here and... Like after 10 months, you're like making the decision if this is going to be a career or not. Yeah. It was quite fast. Yeah. yeah. And um, pretty brave to do it. Like I'm impressed by that. Like just just start by doing. Yeah. It's, it's like the only way that it could have been for me is to either be scared and not do, ever do it or to jump into it uh, with this little bit of savings that I, that I did one year of work to get. And just try and it worked out after 10 months i had some photo shoots and some opportunities that meant that i had enough money to live so i was able actually gave this job to amy so at amy took, took over the job at kex and i entered freelance life in photography Awesome. And yeah. so while you're like trying to support yourself here in Iceland, you're also trying to build up your skill as a photographer, right? Of course, yeah. And how is that going? Because like did you did you think you were like good enough at that time to like support yourself as a photographer? I mean, I was just quite I guess like I was I was second guessing myself a lot and there's so many amazing photographers here and people doing really like interesting Com like commercial photography, like your work, it's really amazing. Thank and you. And I'm very inspired by what you do in the studio. It's freaking cool. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I just felt like there was there was no path for me in just going out and having fun and taking random photos of nature. But then I began to realize that. Most people taking photos in Iceland back then were focusing on the happy days of blue sky weather and the sunsets and, you know, Arctic midnight sun stuff that everyone was absolutely fascinated by. And it wasn't doing much for me. So I, I went out in the bad weather and started to photograph the crazy weather and the storms and the, the blizzards in winter and that became my pure focus and I was obsessed with these interesting weather patterns that we get here and the way that the clouds look, they're just so heavy and moody and I think there's so much detail and so much that you can use for photography with the weather and that shaped my the beginnings of what I find interesting to shoot now. Yeah. And you, like, was that just learning by doing as well? You just, like, traveled and, and try to get the, like, picture you like? Yeah. Pretty much just, uh, I like to say, like, you, you can't get the shot unless you're out there. Yeah. So I didn't know half the time if I was going to get any useful images. I just went out and did stuff, traveled around, went on like 
um, some tours with Kex, like on the Golden Circle and on the glaciers and stuff, because that was the only way that I could afford to actually be outside and out of the city. Wow. I, I couldn't afford to rent a car. Like I couldn't afford to do anything but learn Icelandic at House Goliathlands and work at Kex. Those, that's all I could do for the first year, pretty much. First two years? First year. First year, okay. Yeah. I remember uh, when we did the shoot for Hurra two years ago. Or, well, you did the shoot. I just wanted to go with you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> I remember, like, I was asking you, like, because I've, I'd seen your Instagram and all these pictures from all these places that I hadn't seen myself of Iceland. And I was like, wow, this guy really knows Iceland better than me. <laughs> Uh, which is of no surprise because I didn't travel and I don't travel that much around the country. But I asked you, like, how often do you go travel to the countryside? And you were like, yeah, five out of seven days a week. And I was just amazed that you had the drive to do it. And, like, <laughs> just, like, the motivation to, like, go out. And you probably weren't, like, waking up at nine or ten and, and driving and taking pictures in Thorsmörk at like 2 p.m., it's like crazy hours yeah, yeah. to get the crazy weather you're talking about. Exactly. How how did the schedule look like for you back then? Well, being able to get a car opened up like endless opportunities for me to just be outside. Yeah. And um, I was able to uh, begin like renting a car in the beginning. Uh, I eventually went on to buy that car, so I'm super stoked, so Defender. Yeah. It's kind of the cliche Instagram car here, but it does well for me. It does. Um, and yeah, so my schedule literally just transformed from like just being downtown and going on occasional tours and occasional when a friend would come with a rental car, I could join them kind of thing to me just being able to be outside every day. And that was like an amazing feeling, like the most freeing kind of few months in the beginning, just like. I could go anywhere and shoot and follow the weather and wake up at any crazy hour or be out in any storm that I wanted because I I had the flexibility, had a vehicle and had had time because I had I'd stopped this job and had some some photo shoots and things that helped me kind of push forward. So what was the plan? Like to go outside, get some pictures and post them to Instagram? Yeah. So pretty much that's pretty much what I did for and still do of course yeah. um for the first year especially I was I I really got into a theme of posting Iceland images on social media and because I couldn't go out very much I was using photos from my old trips and then some from the random trips that I was doing you know um around Iceland at that time and yeah, built up this kind of presence, like became known amongst some other people and my friends as just like an Iceland photography guy. Mm. And this progressed. And when I was able to eventually just be out in the mountains and focus on finding like the best possible places to be, then social media had grown to a point where thanks to consistency and posting almost every single day, uh, it was at a point where I was able to explore these kind of interesting areas and yeah, I just post, kept posting them on, on the internet and built up more and more photos, taking thousands and thousands of photos every month. And yeah. And you were also developing your own style, right? Yeah. I mean, the style thing is always, is incredibly hard to actually determine what makes a style and how it comes to be i guess yeah you can't read in like five tips to a your own <laughs> five style tips, five <laughs> tips to a style yeah um i think my like intense interest in the weather and the like the dark moody weather yeah that was the thing that inspired me to or i guess had driven me into a style i, I didn't like push for that style it just kind of happened mm. yeah and you're just like going out, enjoying yourself, taking pictures and posting them to social media and just waiting for something to happen? Or did you have like a plan or you're trying to grow your audience to uh, like some 
amount of followers or like what was the plan? The plan was there any? So like step one for me when I began to be a freelancer in Iceland was I set up a little company here. And um, the plan was always to build it up to the point where I could uh, begin to lead groups of photographers on trips. Oh. That was my way that I thought like, okay, this could become something really cool. Like we can, I can work with someone that I'm inspired by, another photographer, and bring them over and we can work together and do some really cool workshop style trips in the mountains. Yeah. And I have a friend from Australia, his name is Jared Singh, and he and I had done a few trips before I went into freelance world around Iceland, and he was the first one we came up with this idea together to do these trips in Iceland. And combining that with some photo shoots, I, I had started to um, shoot a little bit with 66 North. Yeah. They're the first people to believe in me. Yeah. How does that, like, how did that look like? Uh, how did that begin? The craziest feeling to have a company that I loved, absolutely loved, um, say yes like yeah let's do a shoot like this is awesome i was like what like that is so crazy um and yeah got a jacket and i was like mind absolutely mind blown by this jacket and um that really kicked off like my shooting like portrait style photography and fashion photography which became quite quite a significant part of what i do yeah um and that was through 66 believing in me <laughs> yeah that's awesome yeah and they like you kind of you match the brand a lot like oh. you like travel a lot and like the hostile uh environment <laughs> of iceland and like dress yourself appropriately and and all that so it probably it, and it also led to like you still work with 66 right yeah, absolutely. they just released released the movie about you, or like a short video about you. Yeah, the other day. What was that about? So that that video, I'm super grateful for the opportunity to share a bit about my story, like visually, and um, yeah, it was a story about seeing Iceland from the sky and a little bit about what it's like to move here, as we have kind of moving into more detail today, of course, in podcast, but. Um, that video, yeah, it was just something that like, I feel like I've always wanted to tell like this visual story about how I got to be here. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that was a good representation. And it's really hard to explain the feeling of seeing Iceland from the perspective of both a tourist and a local. Yeah. That's a really weird like juxtaposition there. And it's kind of led to my vision of Iceland being maybe focused on things people hadn't so much considered back five years ago, even. I feel like whenever you say five years, it sounds so recent, but, yeah, but things have changed a lot. Yeah, things have been moving fast. Yeah. So I think actually on that topic, like being a being a tourist and a, and now like moving towards localizing here, as it's been a cool dynamic, actually. You feel, I feel like you're able to really understand like both sides of Iceland. Yeah. But you've never been the guy that just like goes to Gutfoss and Geysir. Yeah. Like you don't seek out the cliches in your pictures, I think. No. Uh, have you ever? I mean, definitely to begin with, that's yeah. something you, that's all you know, kind of. Yeah. And the Northern um, Lights. Yeah. I was addicted to those things. Yeah. Yeah. Shooting pictures? Yeah, just taking photos of these places, the only places I could reach. Like, that's the only places that the bus went, kind of. So um, I definitely started out focusing on those, and over time it's been, it's been looking further into the smaller details that's led to what I find interesting today, the small, subtle shifts and the way things are, uh, adapt to the weather in the landscape and how the colors shift and the seasons affect the landscape. All these things are what I'm super interested in now. Yeah, definitely. You can't look at a, like, rarely I see a picture from you and think like, oh, this is Black Sand Beach or like this, yeah. this uh, tourist trap or whatever it is. 
It's more like some subtle, just it's just kind of uh, an emotion to your pictures. Like, yeah, I mean, it's just my expression of at me attempting to express how I feel when I'm out there. Yeah, and I thought that would like. I was so shocked by looking at the Flickr page and like <laughs> your early Instagram post, which is like only three years ago, yeah. to see like <clears throat> you were like you were doing the exact same pictures as everybody else. Yeah. Like and no disrespect, but like oh, that it, you you just come such a long way and like have this like super distinctive style and like like I said, you can look at a picture and see like oh that's Benjamin Harbin. <laughs> I mean, <clears throat> everyone has to start somewhere. And growing up, I really, as I have said uh, about my degree in accounting, like I just, I never really knew what I was interested in for the longest time. I didn't know. So I tried everything like in photography, I, I shot pictures of everything. And I guess like you can only learn by looking at people that have inspired you and trying to follow in their path. And I mean, I, I never really followed the work of anyone in particular especially in Iceland at the time I was more inspired by the concepts of like doing a long exposure of a waterfall like just like blow my mind to bits <laughs> back then yeah um yeah yeah it's very cool so you go from like being an accountant to photography and you go from Australia to Iceland and then you go from Kverviskata <laughs> to Grimsnes <laughs> like <laughs> It's like a progression of extremes. Yeah. <laughs> um, after two years living downtown and driving over Hetlisedi like every day. Yeah, that's it crazy. It just made more sense to live on the other side yeah. of Hetlisedi. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that opportunity came up to move into the countryside. And Amy and I couldn't say no. We oh. just packed up and moved out into, yeah, a little cabin. And how does your day look like, or a week look like for you now? Like, are you, like, do you stay in Grimsnes the, most of the time, or do you travel to like Thorsmark and stay there, or well, because I, you looked like you were at home when you came to like Volcano Huts, right? Yeah, 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 Like you were just one of the like. It looked like you lived there. You knew everybody. <laughs> yeah, that that really is a second home. Yeah, for me and a few of my friends, definitely. Yeah, it's like a safe haven in the wilderness for us. Um. And I feel the same way about where we live now in Grimsness. Um, I feel though now with my work that I'm more of a reflective person now and I need time to process because my experiences are progressively more extreme, the things that I'm doing these days. And it takes more time. You're outlaying more energy and effort in order to be in those environments shooting and thinking creatively and it requires more time afterwards to just take a minute and try and process what's happened and uh, give yourself some time to analyze the images and uh, decide which ones have a voice that align with the way that your experience was or how your feelings are about that trip. So I spend more time at home now than I did before. But I am also find myself reaching more creative ruts mm. as my like as my style progresses because I, I feel like you can never have a have a style. It's always changing. And I've definitely experienced a few ruts and just being in the countryside and waking up to absolute silence. And that's helped me. A lot. How does uh, those ruts describe themselves? I feel like my creative ruts have come out of the consistency that is needed in order to push social media and grow it. Means that sometimes you maybe aren't thinking outside of the box so as much as just being out and shooting, even if it's like using old methods or like going back to places you've already visited and photographing in the same way, like there becomes a drive to literally just find an image that can mean you stay relevant in posting every day. Mm -hmm. And that drove me into the ground. Eventually, I, I really needed to take a break from doing that. So that that's probably the first creative rut that I had was taking a moment to step back and think, damn, like, I'm not finding this as fun anymore. I think I have to 
look a little deeper into Iceland and find some new locations and find some new subject matter that is inspiring me. And yeah. that meant posting less, of course. On social media? Yeah. Were you at any point like felt like you were driven by the number of and amount of likes you were getting? Like, isn't that a bit difficult to like, of course, you would just want to post and like just drop the phone, like not think about it. But like you probably look at the likes and you see like something is like exploding or something is not working. Like, did it affect you or does it? it def- yeah, it's undeniable that engagement on social media affects you. And it's a learning process to try and switch off from that and try and block it out because really it it shouldn't affect you. It's just a number. And at least for me, I, it's, it took a long time. Like it took a few years for me to to settle. I mean, it's taken up to now. And I've always tried to remain as separate as possible from that world um and spend time not on my phone amy always like tells me to get off my phone um because she's like super in that mindset like she wants to she wants to just be technology free as much as possible in grimsness <laughs> in grimsness <laughs> um so yeah i i feel like there's been periods where those things have affected me more um but i feel really level about those things now Yeah. And less connected to the numbers and more so connected to just putting out online the best the th- the best possible images and the things I'm most proud of and inspired by. And is it enough for you like to be traveling to these like crazy places in these crazy conditions and you get this one photo and you like people don't see the work you put into this one picture it wasn't just the fact that you like went to this place and snapped that picture it's also like you snapped like hundreds of others and you had to like walk through them like again and again and again and then edit one and like realize it wasn't the one you wanted to select and then you go to the another and like you go back and forth yeah and then you post it and it appears on a small screen and people just like swipe to it look at it for a second and then like swipe to the next one yep like how does it like You probably want to some of your pictures to get more attention, right? Definitely, I would love more of my pictures to be printed and yeah. become physical things. Yeah. Um, but obviously, you can't have an exhibition every day. Yeah, um, and it's probably pretty hard to reach five hundred thousand people by printing pictures. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, this is the biggest downfall for me. Yeah, isn't it? Uh, the biggest downfall to explain that. I think for me is the obsession of making every single detail as refined as possible. And this might mean spending 50 hours editing one photo. And by the end, I'm like smashing my head against the wall, like it's never going to be done. And you just have to detach and just like reveal it, put it out there and just be content with it. But to put, you know, like, not always 50 hours, maybe even just two hours of like straight effort and your entire being into editing and thinking how the light is reacting to what's in the photo and sculpting it to have a specific feeling. And then it just end up on a phone screen and like given like one second of attention from people and then gone again yeah. into the abyss of the internet. It It's driven me to want to exhibit my work in person. I yeah. think, yeah. But for the record, like people like, and when they see the exhibition or like see it advertised or like, yeah, like see your name, they know it because you've been throwing out these pictures like yeah, exactly. all year long. Exactly. For all those years. How has like Instagram has probably played a huge role for your career, right? Definitely. Social media has in general and of course, specifically Instagram has been such a vital platform for me to communicate with companies and to communicate my message to quite like to a substantial audience where I I think I can make a difference. So I, yeah, it's been really useful. Yeah. I remember like, uh, when I asked you like two years ago, like, do you know Chris Burkert? And you're like, yeah, we were like chilling out together. And I was like, wow, he knows Chris (laughs) Burkert. He's a legend. He's a legend. (laughs) Yeah. He, He is also like, uh, 
He probably what I think uh, fascinated me about him, like he mastered like the combination of a good picture and a good caption. Yeah, like the, the description. Like, yeah, the storytelling exactly. Uh, you probably met a lot of cool people through Instagram as well, right? Absolutely. That's probably the most awesome thing about this platform is the ability to connect with other creative people yeah. and come up with ideas together and do trips together. And it's crazy. Like sometimes you have no idea who the person is in real life, but you just have this feeling like you're really like on the same wavelengths just by looking at their photos. Yeah. And then you meet them and it's like, yeah, what's up, bro? Like, <laughs> let's go and do some cool stuff. And it just works out every time. So I feel like it's kind of weird. You can kind of assess someone's identity in their photos yeah. most of the time. Yeah. There's, of course, some shifty people out there that <laughs> portray not the correct things through photography. But Damn yes. it. <laughs> Have you had any like travels you remember, like any favorite travels throughout like people you met on Instagram or relationship you established through social media? I mean, I've done a... And not just really travels, cool, just yeah. experiences. Yeah, I met up with some really awesome friends of mine, um, Hannes and Consta, and a, f a friend who I actually met here, who's also living here. He, we call him German Ben. His name is Ben Ren. <laughs> and he's like six foot tall. And like super tank. So we call him Little Ben and I'm Big Ben. Uh, Big ben. <laughs> um, yeah, we did an amazing trip to Hornstander oh, really? um, in the summer. And that was just, was such an awesome group of people to get together and all thanks to Instagram. And we had a great time and we hiked for 50 kilometers through the wilderness, finding Arctic foxes together and laughing and just sharing stories and crossing rivers naked because we didn't want to get our clothes wet. <laughs> it was yeah. awesome. Hotspot <laughs> is a crazy place. Yeah. Well, the, it was last summer? This, this summer? summer. Oh, yeah. cool. Just did this one recently. And you also like know like pilots and like helicopter pilots and, and you get to like do all these crazy things. Yeah. Like what are some examples of the, the trips you've been on? I mean, I've done a fair lot of uh, helicopter flying around Iceland, which has been amazing. Um, I've got a really good friendship with a few of the pilots at Nordlöfluk. And yeah, we just shoot together and come up with cool ideas. And I've joined a few of their trips and seeing Iceland from the sky is just absolutely insane. Yeah, It's that's impossible like a... to describe. Yeah. So yeah, like... And Those then, pictures um, kind of look fake. Yeah, it's crazy, right? Like it hard to, it's hard to imagine, like, to see this with your own eyes. Yeah. Looks like, like, oh, that's Photoshop. Especially in winter when it's just absolutely otherworldly. Like, you can't describe what you're seeing sometimes in the mountains here in the winter when all the colors are gone and you're just left with the most impressive shapes made by the mountains and you don't realize like Landmannalaugar in the summer it will, you're taken by the color but it's not often that people appreciate the form of the mountains there in mm. Fjallabak and when the snow hits and you lose the color you begin to see this form come to life in the shadows in the contours of the mountains and they're just so unique and like that's the the best way I can describe it is just unique yeah That's Unbelievable. True. Well, yeah, so done a, quite a cool amount of uh, projects with with Nordafluch and also with one of my best best pals, Hadi. He's a volcano pilot. Oh, yeah, I've seen that one on oh, Instagram. Oh, yeah. <laughs> He has some good times flying around and taking photos from the sky. He looks like plane. he's the go-to guy when you need to fly around Iceland. Yep, he's become the go-to guy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, you've also been out of Iceland these days. You were telling me you were in Svalbard uh, last month. Yeah, just got back recently from Svalbard. That was beautiful. And that was really like the last three years of me refining my eye and the things that I'm interested in. This was like the first time where I really felt like everything came together. I knew exactly the things I wanted to shoot and luckily got the perfect conditions that I'd been looking to get. Wow. And it just, it really came together. And I was just like, I just speechless by that place and that trip. 
But so what happens like for people who don't understand this profession? Like you, you just go to Svalbard and and you post to Instagram and you uh, support <laughs> yourself by doing that, or like how how does it work? I mean, eventually you're able to find like-minded companies and publications. For instance, the trip with Svalbard I did with a magazine called Suitcase Magazine. They're from the UK. And we shot and the journalists wrote a piece together um, in Svalbard just about things that a normal person could do there because it seems like this high Arctic crazy place that you have to be crazy to go to. Yeah, polar But, beers and yeah, exactly. Polar beer. <laughs> polar, polar beer. beer. <laughs> Did polar you see beer. the small reindeer from Svalbard? Small reindeer? Yeah, like they had these like squeezed edition of a reindeer. I mean, they've got like f like fat reindeer with tiny legs. Yeah, yeah, I'm to yeah. Probably talking probably about the that same one. thing. Yeah. <laughs> they, they look really weird. Actually, yeah, don't they? Yeah, you really saw them strange. with your own eyes. Yeah, yeah, crazy. They're cool. Really, I just love it. Like. To see the reindeer here, and then in Greenland, and then in Svalbard, like all these reindeer look different, but yeah. they're like they're just adapted to the landscape and their surroundings. Like it's so cool. Yeah, that's crazy. I know that the reindeer in Svalbard, going into winter, they completely stock up. Like they don't stop eating. They get as fat as possible because if they don't, they die. So they have to eat it as much as they can and, and stock just up. store it all. Yeah. Wow. But you've been to Greenland as well. Yeah. So that's like one of the biggest, uh, thing, well, something I'm extremely grateful for is the uh, opportunity to have gone to Greenland quite a few times in the last couple of years. And um, those opportunities have both been just completely self-directed, self-funded missions purely for no reason other than just experiencing and photographing there. And other times I've been... Um, fortunate enough to work with the tourism board and with shooting for like Air Iceland and they're flying there all the time. Um, and those trips to Greenland just completely shaped my perspective of the Arctic because before that, like, yes, Iceland is an extremely remote place that is crazy and extreme, but at the end of the day, it's quite civilized yeah. and <laughs> Like going to Greenland is like, it's a it's a going to a completely different environment and completely different culture. That it it's like it just a, it's a very unique experience, and seeing that part of the Arctic being actually in the Arctic for the first time there, I I just felt I felt like I I'd filled a missing piece of the puzzle for me. Really? Yeah. It felt like the right place to be shooting. The right place. The oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The right the place right to place. be shooting. Yeah, at the time. Okay. Yeah. But, but even in the city, you feel that? Um, I mean, the city there has massive icebergs right next to it. Oh, is in it really Ululisat, like that? If I'm gonna specify a specific place, yeah, Ululisat is next to Disco Bay, which is full of gigantic icebergs. They think the one from the Titanic that got the Titanic actually came from this fjord. Wow. Yeah. So that that particular place, like, yeah, even just from the city, you can see massive icebergs. Just the, such a surreal experience. How are the people there? Um, really nice. Yeah. Just like uh, it it just it just like different way of life, completely different. And there is a of course a large Danish presence in Greenland, and that makes it a little more relatable, I guess. Um, it would be super awesome if i knew danish anyone that knows danish <laughs> go to greenland that would be super cool um but yeah and then going from greenland to svalbard it's like okay i'm starting to kind of get a understanding of the arctic now and even just between ice and greenland and svalbard there are so many differences like each one has glaciers and mountains and sparse empty landscapes but they each have their own unique identity and Getting photographs and being able to portray those unique identities is something I'm extremely like passionate about now. Mm. Do you still feel like Iceland has an identity despite the uh, like all the tourists that have been coming here and and like 
kind of the internet bringing all everybody together and like in the city it's like do you still find we have some uniqueness left <laughs> because like you you live in Grimsness and you travel to the countryside and and the highlands and the mountains of Iceland yeah. but like what about the city like when you go to the city of Greenland and and I can I could believe that it's a lot more unique than Reykjavik yeah like I mean Reykjavik I mean, being a bit more international right Reykjavik is like gentrified now and it's it's a similar it's like a Scandinavian city experience now when you go downtown yeah apart from all the construction yeah yeah But um, yeah, I mean, I've definitely, to me, tourism here is in a way completely cut off from the experiences of Iceland that I have now, because even today you can take two steps on, on a side path or on a side road and you're completely alone in a place that is unbelievably busy. Yeah, And it's just like... There's, it's like there's two sides of Iceland, really. And tourism is very directed. It flows in, in the same places every day. Like, And what's an amazing thing is finally there's infrastructure for these people. Like there's restaurants and just like even like toilet facilities. Just like the basic things are finally like popping up in all the places where they really need to be now, especially in the south, because that's, you know, where the bulk of people go. Yeah. And the chaos is kind of slowly working its way to be like a refined industry, I feel like, very yeah. slowly. But of course, also it's flattening out, I think. Yeah. What yeah. about other photographers coming to Iceland and like uh, like doing the same stuff as you, basically? Like, uh, like there are a lot of pictures of Iceland on Instagram. Yes, it's become like an Instagram place. Yeah. It's unbelievable. Like, And, you know... If the, everyone has an element of luck for them mm -hmm. in their in their career, and I think if luck plays any part in my career now, it's that when I moved here, there were no really there was not many people using Instagram to regularly and consistently post about Iceland. True, and that I I filled a void. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and also, crazy. like, people who come here for one visit, they typically don't, like, go to the places you go. Yeah, exactly. Of course, that's the cool thing as being, like, a foreign person is I'm able to understand both sides because I've been that tourist. Yeah. I've done the exact, I've done the Golden Circle trip, like, as a tourist and yeah. all these places. And I can I can relate to the feelings that these people have. Like, it's it's common for people to come here have an insane trip and leave crying on the airplane, not wanting to go. Like that, Iceland has a profound effect on people. It's unbelievable. Yeah, well, I haven't heard that like yeah. side of the story. I mean, take me for example, like on the five, I think it was five trips that I did here before I lived here, I there was at least two flights leaving Iceland where I was in tears. Like, damn, I have to leave again, like... Fly 30 hours to Australia now. Damn. Well. Wow. Bye. <laughs> um, it's just, there's something that I think either you love it, it's a love or hate place. Like people can come here, have, get stuck in a storm, their trip goes wrong, they leave um. and they hate Iceland. Other people can get stuck in that storm, be absolutely mind blown by nature see the craziest mountains, the storm doesn't matter, their trip's been all screwed up, but they're like, hey, whatever, like, this is so cool because I'm, like, in nature and I've never seen, like, a blizzard before. And then their life changes. They're, like, impacted by this so much that their perspective on maybe on traveling and experience would shift dramatically to focus on maybe nature instead of visiting cities. Maybe they they want to seek more experiences like the ones that they've had here. And I feel like this is the place that has created those feelings for a lot of people. Uh, that's a good point. Where do you go when you, like, <laughs> when it's just another day for you and you're just heading to the car and about to drive away from your hut in, in Grimsness? Like, which direction do you go to? Like, you've you've been everywhere. I've been quite a lot of places. You have? Yeah. Just like But they all look different, driving. right? Ah, uh, yeah. Depending on the weather. 
depending on the weather and the part of Iceland, like Iceland is so dynamic that the landscape changes with just an hour of driving. Um, and then the weather changes on you, so everything is just changing and you can never keep up. It's exciting. Um, it still excites you? Oh, yeah. Okay. I, I think that's what excites me most now is I have the portrayal of the Arctic and really analyzing the fine details of Iceland because this is home now and this is where I see the most amount of shifts in, in the nature because I'm looking at it pretty much every day. And that's just such subtle changes that occur, like leaves freezing over on the trees and then melting again the next day and then falling off and then snow comes on top of it and then the whole color of the landscape changes and like maybe everyone else was photographing this one tree from a distance because it looks banger with the mountain behind or something. But there's so many cool things happening like on a more detailed level that can make beautiful photos and are super interesting. I think trees is a terrible example, by the way, because there's <laughs> not exactly many of them here. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah. So you're still excited about like what what a place looks like that you've been to like hundreds of times. Yeah. It's a seasonal progression that gets me excited. And how did you learn to like drive across the rivers of Thorsmörk and all that? Like a guy from Australia crossing like glacier rivers <laughs> on a on your car. Thanks to all the local gumleys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all, all just, like, luckily, I've been surrounded by um, Icelanders that have welcomed me into their outdoor lifestyle and just really given me much needed direction in how to travel in the nature here and how to be safe and, you know, how to cross a river correctly with like minimizing your chance of getting swept away. So, yeah, thankfully, like people like the guys at Midgard in Kolsvetlut, those guys there are just absolute legends. And they were they're just opening like, open to helping out a guy who wanted to travel. Yeah, Iceland we and just take like pretty much hit it off. Yeah. Awesome. And I joined them to my first winter expedition was with the guys at Midgard. And I went to their hut in, just to the south of Hofsjökull. And going there in the middle of winter is like a proper mission. <laughs> uh, I was just like newly living here, kind of, I think I'd been here like a year. So I was just some like Australian guy trying to settle down here, work things out. And then I'm thrown into like ultra winter expedition Iceland. Shows. And I think that really, that shaped the the current like Jeep guy that I am was like shaped by hanging out with those guys. For sure. And seeing the potential of like winter travel and the options for exploring in the harder to reach places. Awesome. Have you ever been in like any dangerous situations? Yeah, there's there's been some some real uh some real scary times. Yeah, over Have the years. some stories for us? Yeah. Uh the one that comes to mind these days, I, I always used to go to this river story where I was in Thorsmerk and I got stuck there for five days because the river flooded and oh, wow. I literally couldn't cross back. Um, and I saw like a really expensive super jeep drown, which was crazy. In the river? In the river, yeah. Um, but what what has had a profound impact on me now is an experience I had on Eyjafjallajökull in uh, in like April this year. Um, and I wasn't alone. This happened to many people. It was just a freak set of circumstances with the ice. Uh, I was driving up to the summit. I'd, I've done it many times in my car, but this particular day, like the sun had was roasting. Like it was, it had melted the entire grippable layer of, of snow away from the surface. And then I found myself, me and Amy and two friends, sliding down Eyjafjallajökull backwards in my car. Whoa. Yeah. And that was the first moment I realized, like, damn, like, I have no control right now. And, I mean, to anyone who's seen, like, you're driving down the route, route one on the ring road and you see a if you could in the distance it's huge it's a massive volcanic glacial mountain like sliding down that with no control like was very scary and changed my whole perspective on driving on the snow on the ice and 
like there's a lot of things to know and a lot of things to assess before entering the mountains and driving on the snow. Damn. Yeah. Did you just like pull the handbrake and just like wait for it to stop or? Well, the craziest thing is it had perfect grip going up and I was really near, near there's a rock called Gold Estate on the summit. Super beautiful. I was really close to it. I just stopped to check my GPS to make sure I was on the green path of the glacier and and I just lost traction and there's nothing I could do brakes like going forwards nothing stopped the car sliding backwards and luckily I had a snow patch went sideways for a bit which was the ultimate moment of like okay are we going to have to like bail from the car right now like Whoa. yeah super intense moment And I never show my fear because I always trust myself that I can get us out of the situation if like, you know, the river's deep or something happens. But at that moment I was, my voice changed. Amy says like my voice changed and then like she got scared too. And yeah, I I never want to have that experience again of losing control. Like it changed my perception of driving on the road. It changed everything about driving for me that one day. That is crazy. Yeah. We ended up turning around, luckily, and then sliding pretty much the rest of the way going forwards, which was much better. <laughs> <laughs> which was much better. Yeah. But, like, any other people on the glacier that day? Um, yeah, there was, like, three other cars that slid down that day. And it, it just caught us all by surprise. Yeah. And there was, there was like, you know, 10-plus cars that over the space of, like, two days slid down this mountain. Even, like, a, a tour group, like of people driving, like tourists driving super jeeps <laughs> slid down the mountain. Um, but yeah, I think it's just like a freak icing of yeah. the glacier. So yeah, Nothing I think no, one, no one's to blame. It just happened. And luckily it's not that steep and there's nothing in the way. So, um, but yeah. I've seen you like, I think it was on Instagram stories or something. You were just like, like posting a, video of like how stupid it was for this car to be driving across <laughs> the river and then you're like a couple of minutes later like he's stuck and being dragged out of the water like see i told him yeah so on that topic using my social media to help spread awareness for safe and conservative travel measures in iceland what the place that i'm passionate about i travel to i want to protect and i want to act responsibly Using social media has allowed me to share all the, the values that I have with uh, all the people that are coming here. Yeah. And crossing rivers is a prime example because it's been heavily glamorized by, you know, me included, all of us in the past that go out there and, and it looks cool to cross the rivers. So we're all like taking photos and videos and crossing the rivers and... Adventures. Like adventures. People it just want a bit like, of the extreme. Yeah, people want to get amongst that. Yeah. It's cool. So... The negatives are people are going to these areas in the wrong cars to start with and without any knowledge of what to do because anyone, for instance, can drive to Thorsmuk. There's no like gate or yeah. anything. Anyone can go there. And it's just, it's so unfortunate that someone died from this yeah. just a few months ago. Like a couple was stuck in the river and had to evacuate their rental car and the lady slid over and something happened that yeah unfort super it's really sad like it's hard to even talk about and i can't even begin to describe like how sad it must have been for my friends that live out there to you know and for the guy himself who's just lost his partner and Yes, it's it's unbelievably sad and could have been avoided by them not driving their rental car into the smoke. But who's going to stop people going there? Yeah. So all I can do as someone with a significant outreach for Iceland is use it to show the correct ways and what cars you shouldn't take and stuff. So I made this story and I was saying like uh, someone unfortunately lost their life like because um, of an accident in the river, like these small cars really shouldn't come here. And then as I said it, this car drove past me. So I like panned around to it. I was like, this is the type of car that shouldn't come here. And then I got a call from my friends 10 minutes later. They're like, yeah, we're just going to get someone out of the river. And 
it was that car. Yeah. Got stuck. So it's like, it really sucks for them because their car got like totaled and sucked in a bunch of water and never started again, as far as I'm aware. But it was great for the message in that it really showed like that this is a serious thing and a lot of people get stuck. So yeah. it's better to just not take the risk. Yeah, I'm just like super articles. scared when I'm in a car, which is ex- like, I've never been driving the car or crossing the rivers, but like, doesn't matter who it is. Like, even if it was you, I'm just like so scared <laughs> when we hit the water. Like, I can't take it. Like, yeah, I'm, uh, yeah. maybe too cautious. Maybe. Uh, I wanted to ask you like, uh, like if I could experience and learn from your experience in any way and know the things that you have learned the hard way. Like being a freelance photographer, uh, like it must have been difficult at times, right? Oh yeah. Like Many what have you what have you learned like by like being so like being so accountable for yourself and like uh holding yourself accountable for like doing the work and supporting yourself and making your own business hours and and being responsible for like like posting that picture and and post like just yeah support yourself like it's no you you got no instructions at all yeah. and you move to this country with no career at all mm-hmm. and you don't speak the language <laughs> and you're not gonna get like <laughs> like what have you learned on the way um i've learned that you really have to create some sort of path and schedule that can, you can stick to. And it's really hard to find discipline when there's no boss. Um, but even just telling yourself, like, if you have a free moment, come up with brainstorm some ideas, like on maybe a, a company that has similar values to you that you could pitch to for a shoot or uh, simply like dedicating time to editing. Even if you feel like you've spent all day editing like commercial shoots, take that extra hour to edit for yourself and you maybe, you might find something that inspires you that hadn't been in your vision before. So definitely having that schedule and being able to, I guess, preempt things and plan ahead is what has allowed me to stay sane in this crazy freelance career. Yeah. And like also, like we were talking about uh, before we started recording, or I was saying like um, the thing with commercial photography is like you get asked to do, well, if you establish yourself as a commercial photographer, like you you shoot for companies, uh, you get asked to shoot for more companies, hopefully. And uh, like the thing is, What I felt was the bad thing about that is you get asked and you're so afraid to say no because you're saying no to like money to make a living that you just keep saying yes and you say yes to the next one and the next one and the next one and suddenly I found myself like just doing something that I didn't want to be doing at all and I've always admired about you like you've always been doing what you wanted to do and like do these side missions of like something probably that didn't align completely with what you wanted to do. I'm, I'm guessing here. Yeah. But like you've figured out a way to do what you wanted to do inside the realm of photography. Yeah. Like, wasn't that a difficult path to like begin with? Uh, and and yeah. like you said, you started out working at Kex. Like that's yeah. definitely not what you came here to do, right? Wasn't my end goal. No, Let's it wasn't the end goal. Way. Um, you have to take on and say yes to a lot of things that maybe you aren't so keen to do specifically for your growth in photography or any freelance career really but in saying yes to those things it's an extension of the idea that you should just try everything and eventually you work out the things that you're most interested in and the things that don't give you maybe any benefit for your career or things that have been a loss of time maybe and it takes a while but in the beginning it's so worth doing as much work as you can and of course trying to at least get the correct value for your time and that is so hard to work out especially when you're starting out like you feel like 
you feel bad like you couldn't you I couldn't earn money from getting doing photos like I just feel horrible like they shouldn't pay me I'm just like learning but the truth is like this company has employed you because they believe in your skill and your time is worth something and the more confident you are in in showing that you you have a value and you you have you want to stick to that value and it's it's okay if they they aren't happy with it like maybe we can discuss it and work something out but if you don't say it to begin with then maybe you're missing out on an opportunity to to grow and expand your relationship with someone or some company or whatever it is you're doing but yeah at the at the end of the day you have to say yes to a lot of things that you don't want to do before you can work out if your passion is aligning with your career <laughs> yeah no doubt i think like yeah i don't regret saying yes so many times to something that i didn't want to do because like i think the problem is more like if you ne- if you say no to a lot of things you never realize like what sh- what you really want to do yeah and i okay. think that's a problem with like many people are facing right now they don't know what to do and that's because they're doing nothing yes yeah so why not get out there and use your time even if like i mean i i've spent times working like all day sleeping for like two hours then getting back out to catch the light again when when like in the middle of summer when there is no darkness and after three months you're literally completely burnt out and there's no energy left and then you sleep for two days but for me that's a way more effective solution than you know waking up at 8 a.m every day and like having your your schedule and your structure and then uh sticking to that kind of even and stable day-to-day lifestyle it hasn't been the way for me like i love and i feel most active in my mind late at night and i mean it's challenging if like amy has gone to bed and i feel bad like she's up there and i'm just like down here on my computer like doing random editing that I don't even know if it has any point but my mind is just like buzzing and I just need to get it out into the computer or into the editing screen and if that works for you go for it like it's what worked for me I I spent hours nerding out late at night on camera equipment and like methods and technology and and that's works for some people try and try all sorts of schedules I would say <laughs> yeah see what works I, yeah, I think it like, have you never struggled with like just the confidence of like believing in what you're doing? Like, because nobody, like you don't have, like I said, instructions and like, like, oh, you, now it's time. Now you should take two hours to uh, develop your editing or now you should take like two hours to see if you need a new camera or what it is. Like, you don't know when you're doing the right thing or the wrong thing. You kind of like, I guess you're just freestyling a lot, right? Yeah, a lot of freestyling. And you're just okay with that? That just fits your personality? Yeah, I mean, I'm willing to take risks. And I maintain, like, I I'm quite. A, I feel like I'm quite a friendly person. And I feel like if there's ever a misunderstanding, it doesn't have to be a negative thing. Like, you don't have to beat yourself up for it. Like, you can work around it. And you can even turn a misunderstanding or, like, a job that maybe a client's not happy with into a positive thing. Because maybe you'll be like, okay, I'm just going to go out and shoot some extra shots even though you're not asking me to because I want to prove to you that I'm willing to work with what you're looking for and uh, I'll create something to the best of my abilities. Mm. I mean, I've done a job for uh, for a tourism client that basically said like, thanks for the photos, but where's the good ones? Whoa. And I was like, whoa, this is insane. That is insane. <laughs> yeah. And, um, I, I just said, like, I didn't get like annoyed because I mean, the photos I sent, what I was passionate about, I thought they were cool, but I just went with it and took a few extra hours to, you know, find some shots that based on what she'd said, aligned better with the, uh, strategies that they had employed, employed on the shoot that we did. And they were happy in the end and i see the photos all over the internet for that area so this is like this is a stunning sentence where are the good ones like <laughs> yeah because it's like insane. it's not like you're 
you, you like photos aren't like a fully developed product like it's, it's something that you like edit until you think it's good and they are like paying you to deliver something that you think is good and then they evaluate it and like no this is not the good stuff and you're just like oh wow i'm just like i can <laughs> like feel it physically like where for, are the good you know, ones people like us it's like these the things we do we're so passionate about yeah and of course everything that like we do isn't going to be praised there's always going to be some negativity to deal with as part of any business so being able to react to that and be able to turn it into a positive if it, if you can or not let it affect you and just say okay you know their interests are different to mine like that's totally fine not everyone likes the same things like the less you can beat yourself up the more you can progress yeah yeah that's pretty good so what's uh, what's the plan for you now i am like, <laughs> counting <laughs> account <laughs> punk band yeah i tried to have a band here no way yeah but i couldn't commit because i was always in the mountains <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so that those days are gone, I think. Oh well. But um I'm really looking forward to uh winter of just being here. Yeah? Yeah. I just want time. Like to drive into the mountains and go snowshoeing and learn how to ski finally. You're gonna do that? Yeah, because I grew up at a beach area. I didn't Ooh. we didn't have mountains to ski down where I'm from, so Do you surf? Uh, very badly. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I could probably stand up. You've never been <laughs> with like Chris and, and Heydar Loy and the guys? Oh, I've been surfier. out with those guys, yeah. Been out with Heydar and the crew and, and photographed them. And that was a really enlightening experience because they're pushing themselves so hard to be out in that water. Like yeah. we were out and then there was like a snowstorm. It's like, you guys are nuts. Like It's freezing. But they're just fueled by their like, passion and drive to surf in the cold climate and i mean that like hey those made a career out of it. it's amazing yeah it's that inspiring is amazing. yeah how does it what, like what did that look like you you guys just surfing in like freezing temperature in the evening during like in the middle of the night yeah i mean uh just something <laughs> just super random yeah yeah we we just went on a little boat out to a cool surf break off like on a small uh, island and forgot to put the thing in the boat in to stop the water coming in so we were like sinking <laughs> <laughs> but we made it and um yeah it's just amazing to see snow and a surfer as an australian where i'm used to seeing 40 degrees celsius and a surfer and me sweating sitting on the shore thinking why am i holding a camera when i could be in the water yeah it's different. Yeah, those guys go for some crazy experiences. Yeah. Now you've uh, seen probably more of Iceland than most Icelanders, like ninety nine point nine percent of <laughs> other Icelanders. For people who are like living in the city and and want to see more of our country, uh, what would you recommend? <laughs> let me give you some ideas <laughs> <laughs> no but like i i yeah. i feel like myself like when when i see your pictures and when i hear your stories i'm like wow i'm missing out on a lot of just like the adventure side of being a human not not that like i'm talking about being an icelander and living in this country i'm just like wow there are so many things that you can just make like make them happen like you moved from the beach in australia to iceland because you wanted to yeah. And I think I'm not the only one thinking like, yeah, I should probably go more out to nature. Yeah. But like it looks like there are so many so many things holding you back. I don't know what it is. Like mm. Well, something that everyone here has that it's taken me years to even begin to scratch the surface of is having family and friends who maybe have cabins in the wilderness or like are doing trips in the highlands like iceland is such a connected place and everyone is friends with everyone pretty much and like it's possible for for most people to find a way to go out to the highlands and 
And a lot of people have, you know, a small four by four so they can drive out. And I mean, I've had a, I took my friend Hjalmar into the mountains and we were standing at the edge of this like beautiful valley and he was just like lost for words. And he said like, wow, like this is my country, like I'm from here, like what? And that was such a fulfilling moment for me because I, I pretty much got used to seeing these things. Mm. And I feel like it's just not in like some people's thought process to go and look at those things, even though they're just here and you can get to beautiful places in one hour. Yeah. Like I, I think there's so much information within the Icelandic community on cool places to go and and it all you have to do is just ask friends and family like hey i actually thought like maybe i should go look at the mountains today and then yeah it's possible to find a way is it hard for you to like see crazy northern lights and just like oh i'm not gonna reach for my camera i'm just gonna enjoy it that that's in itself actually has become something i feel quite used to now and i'm and i understand how people that have seen it for their whole life aren't phased by it but i prefer to look at it than take photos of it and mm. i think that's literally just because the green green photo with the dark landscape is not something i'm really interested in myself personally no as with sunsets and and like just shooting a picture of the red clouds and the sun yeah like that's not what I'm interested in. So I'd rather just go and experience those things and then point my camera at something I like or in the mm. other direction. That's generally what happens. It's like the cool things going on to the left and the crazy things going on to the right and everyone's cameras are pointed to the to the sun and you know, maybe there's two people looking at the cool like mountain peaks sticking out of the clouds yeah. in the other direction. But you don't have a trouble or like uh trouble with like I guess the word is like being mindful of the things that are happening in front of you and only looking through the camera to see it and like, you know where I'm going with this? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and again, that's why like if, I, if I'm if i seeing a crazy northern light, maybe I just lay on the ground and look at it with my eyes instead of through the camera. Yeah. And def I feel like over over the years, I've I appreciate those moments more than I used to because before I was more stressed, like frantic, like just entered the freelance world I need to be shooting everything. I need to yeah. be getting photos all the time. Instagram's gonna love this. Yeah. <laughs> so as you refine your your um, interests and you work out what you're actually keen to shoot, maybe you can afford to drop the camera for a minute and just experience it. Yeah. Uh, before I let you go, Ben, big Ben, <laughs> uh, what what do you like what have you changed your mind about since you moved to Iceland like and not as a photographer just as a person and I'm not talking about the impact Iceland has had on you mm -hmm. even though that probably shapes the answer but like more of your experience in the last three years man that is that's a tough one well the the thing I've realized especially in the last three years is how valuable family relationships are because i'm as far i'm almost as physically as far from my family as you could possibly be in the world that is true yeah but thankfully we have technology and i feel like i speak i call home and i and amy too like a lot like probably more than you would if you're living in the same place as them yeah it's a really strange dynamic there but like because you're not in the same environment, you want to catch up, you want to learn. So if anything, like that can be a message of like, don't be afraid to like move out of your comfort zone. Maybe it means moving abroad. Like you can still remain connected to your friends and family. Um, and if you're moving into Europe, then of course you can just fly home super easy, super cheap. But that that's something that I've realized. So not so much that has changed about me, um, but yeah, the biggest things that have changed about me in the last three years is, uh, going from a pretty stable, like university timetable 
into work where things were kind of you had a set schedule for the next week to being completely thrown out onto your own in the deep end and needing to create your own schedule and your own time and your own motivation to do what you love and it can be really hard but if you can just find the drive within and drink a lot of coffee or knocker as everyone <laughs> drinks around here <laughs> then you maybe, yeah oh yeah um then, where do you yeah. find the drive within you um the drive within me comes from the landscape as as cliche as that sounds i'm just super drawn to to these changes in weather and i'm just addicted to being out there and searching for like unique compositions and things even in places that are already really well known yeah looks like just like yeah the photography and like taking pictures of the landscape is kind of a side effect for you yeah definitely so you you still enjoy traveling around iceland even though you've been like to the places hundreds of times before oh yeah it's beautiful i love that um where can people find your work yeah my work is online on my website and on instagram you update at- your website Uh yeah. You don't do as me, like, okay, I'm gonna get my <laughs> website up and running, and then it's just like six years old. Yeah. I'm trying to be better. Okay, okay. Yeah, but I understand the feeling. It's tough. <laughs> yeah. Um yeah, Instagram, Benjamin Hardman. And I always love to uh rep my girlfriend's work as well, because she is amazing and she is doing really interesting things here in Iceland focused on dark art and the sagas. Dark indeed. Very dark. Yep. So everyone well, check out sundowns, broke, right? at broken sundowns one word. That's Amy. Amy. And you are just at Benjamin Hardman. Yeah. Uh Benjamin Takerla Ferrer Spjatlith. Yeah, that was rekkar. Tack för att komma igår och kära alla ledarna över heidena från Grimsnesi. Oh yeah. Och uh, Ég kvett alla sem eru hlusta til að kíkja á myndina hans Benjamin þær eru magnaðar uh, Ég það er ekki hægt að nota orð til að reyna að lýsa þessu Þið verðið bara að kíkja á þetta sjálf at Benjamin Hartmann á Instagram Benjamin, thanks again for coming Já, takk að þið fyrir það Þá er þættinum í dag lokið Kæra þakkir til sponsor og þáttarins Joe and the Juice og Oregó Sound good and nice.